We're going to go ahead and get started as it is a little past six o'clock and we want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, so good evening and welcome to SSM Health Cardinal Glennon's Children's Hospital event, Accessing Safe Care During the Pandemic, Return to the Classroom Edition. My name is Michelle Romano and I'm the Vice President of Patient Care Services and Chief Nursing Officer here at Cardinal Glennon and also your moderator for the program. We're happy to have you here tonight with us for our panel discussion. During the next hour, our panel of experts will be answering your questions regarding care of your child during a pandemic. We'll first introduce our panel of experts and then we'll open up the chat room to your questions. Please remember to submit your uh, questions to, via the chat box and I will read each question aloud and one of our experts will answer. Um, this session is being recorded and we will be able to share this via social media um, after the uh, event is over. For tonight's panel, we have with us Dr. Charney, Dr. Phillips, and Dr. Cormier. Dr. Charney, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Rachel Charney. I'm a pediatric emergency medicine physician at Cardinal Glennon, um, as well as the medical director for disaster preparedness. Thank you. Dr. Phillips, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Dr. Michelle Phillips. I am a primary care pediatrician working primarily in Cardinal Glennon's practices in Troy and Warrington, and I'm the medical director for our five outpatient practices. Thank you. Dr. Cormier, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Dr. DePores Cormier. I'm a developmental behavioral pediatrician at the Knights of Columbus Developmental Center at Cardinal Glennon Children's Hospital. Thank you all. We will now move on to our panel discussion tonight. Um, again, please submit your questions via the chat box. I'll read each question aloud and we'll have one of our experts answer. I guess as we get started, um, would one of you like to talk about safety precautions that parents and kids can take as they return to the classroom? Sure, I can take that one. <laughs> so I think, well, I think it's super important that um, kids are returning to the classroom and where we have more and more data that it can be done safely provided there's proper precautions in place. So I think the biggest ones are that um, schools have a plan in process, a plan in place for daily symptom screening prior to kids coming and that parents are vigilant about not sending sick children to school. Um, as well as maintaining physical distancing in the classroom. So coming up with a plan for that and cohorting students that will enable schools to then perform contact tracing should they have a positive case in the school. Um, hand hygiene, obviously very important. Masking, um, so really enforcing that with both students and staff. So kids and adults is really important and having proper cleaning procedures in the schools. Um, I think it can be done safely provided these guidelines are followed and we can adapt and refine policies if something's not working. I think equally important is for parents to have a plan of what to do if they find out one afternoon that their child has been placed on quarantine um, and a child care plan in place for the next two weeks while they're on the quarantine process. Hey, thank you. Okay, please remember to submit your questions. Um, via the chat box. While we're waiting for some questions, um, would one of you want to talk about social distancing as well as behavior issues um, regarding that, the social distancing? Well, I'll take that one. Um, so, you know, when I think it's probably important to kind of take a step back and think about like, the pandemic, what are some things that children thrived on, okay? Uh, things such as like structure and routine, um, and sort of regular social interactions. And then think about the fact that because of the pandemic, because of the need to social distance, a lot of that has been sort of either dramatically changed or been taken away very quickly. And so as families are kind of coping with, with social distancing um, and some of the stresses that it causes, I think there are a couple of things that families can try to do uh, to, uh, to help support, you know, children. Probably one of the most important things is try to create, especially for families who are not returning to school, um, to try to create as much as reasonably possible, and for families who are returning to school, some, some sort of schedule or structure uh, uh, to a child's day. 
Um, and uh, so a child kind of has some understanding of what's going to happen tomorrow, as much as is reasonably possible, you know. Um, kind of the other things we typically talk about, regular sleep, regular exercise as, as, as tolerable, you know, um, are probably important, are really important in uh, kind of helping children cope with how much the world has changed really in a matter of six months or so. Um, with that being said, I think especially when it comes to maybe some older children, um, limiting media consumption um, um, to, you know, what is really just pertinent. Um, you know, also just, I think it's really important to, you know, make time to connect. Make time to connect with the friends that they have, make time to connect, you know, uh, with family members, grandparents through sort of safe, socially distanced, you know, uh, uh, means. This can look like things sort of like this, like Zoom, um, telephone calls and what have you, uh, but really just making time to, you know, we talk about social distancing, but really making time to try to be, to have those social connections uh, in a safe manner. Um, so when we think about social distancing and some of the behavioral concerns that I have, that parents might be seeing, um, those are some of the things I think can be, you know, really helpful uh, to help children cope. Thank you. We have our first question um, in the chat box. So as it relates to children playing sports through school, what recommendations for player and team health or safety does the panel have? Are these similar to return to school overall or any specific thoughts related to sports activities? I mean, I can take that one as well. I mean, I think it's gonna be similar to return to school and it's really gonna depend on the sport itself. So the higher contact sports are obviously gonna increase the risk. So I think it's important to look at the level activity, where the sport's occurring, is it indoor, is it outdoor? How big are the teams? Um, trying to limit spectators and making sure people are masking. Um, you know, I think if it's, if it's uh, a, a sport where the child's going to be running often and really exerting themselves and masking is difficult. I think that's where you need to try and mitigate risk where you can, um, trying to keep them as distant as you can. But again, I think it can be done safely. And I think the data is showing that this, the coronavirus, this COVID-19 virus isn't acting the same way, particularly in young children, that, that the flu is acting and doesn't seem to be spreading amongst children um, the way some of our other viruses do. So I think, you know, returning to play, putting those proper precautions in place, making sure they're hand washing, limiting contact, limiting spectators, and, and again, revising plans that aren't working if we're starting to see outbreaks that we're not anticipating. Yeah, and, and I would also add, um, because I've, I've had to make some of these considerations for myself as a parent, as well as as a physician, um, a lot of our choices in what kind of activities we've chosen to participate in this fall is a combination of exactly um, what Dr. Phillips is talking about, about those precautions in place, what the level of support is of, around that sport from the rest of the team, the school, et cetera, but also how important that is to my kids. Because we know that every additional activity we do, however small the risk is, does add some level of additional risk. And is that activity important enough for my kids to, take on that particular risk is, and that, that sort of plays into it as well. I think there's a lot of, we have to be a little more thoughtful for us, at least as a family, about what we've decided to engage in and what we haven't um, this year than we usually would. I, I would have to agree with that. I think thinking about the, you know, there are different activities and they might be modified, you know, say for example, like not sports, but say if your kid was in an art class, you know, um, you know, thinking about like, or are the art easels, you know, six feet apart, or things like that, or kids masking and things like that. You know, just looking at those, you know, um, those types of activities and just thinking about like, are they being done sort of in a way similar to how Dr. Phillips was describing, uh, you know, sports, activ sports activities. I think just some flexibility with, as we learn more and more about this virus, um, being able to put the precautions in place as they're needed. 
And doing things a little bit differently as far as, you know, having kids bring their own sports equipment when they can, not sharing amongst the team, you know, trying to limit touch points, really trying to limit potential exposures. And, and much like Dr. Charney said, I do think it's going to be different for, for families just based on risks they have for their individual children and for family members in the home. It's going to look different for everybody. Thank you. Our next question. Um, do schools need special filters if meaningful transmission is airborne? I should probably jump in on that one. Um, so the primary, as far as we can tell at this point, the primary means of transmission for COVID-19 is droplet. Um, most of the schools that have reopened have done so without special filtration systems and are thus far being successful in their openings um, for the most part, uh, as far as spread, uh, et cetera. So, uh, it, we have not around the area been seeing these filters being put into place. Again, I think those are all things that are under consideration when we look at how COVID winds up acting in our buildings, particularly as we go into the winter season, et cetera. Thank you. Our next question, uh, what can be done regarding student touch by other students or teachers? Do you know what the schools are doing regarding school nurses and their offices? I guess I'm not entirely sure what's meant by student touch. If, I, I, if we mean that students touching, physically touching other students, um, I think most then, which is, I guess I'm reading that at this point, happy to take clarification. Um, I think that's being handled on a school by school basis, how they're enforcing social distancing, depending on, on developmental levels, et cetera. I haven't heard a particular universal plan on how those, those decisions are put into place. Um, and as far as school nurses and their offices, um, I know there was a lot of discussion amongst the schools of how to make enough room in the nurses' offices to allow for like a sick and a, a well area to make sure that we keep um, children who may have COVID uh, based on their symptoms while they're waiting to be picked up and evaluated, et cetera separate from the kids who may just be coming for the medicines? Are there things we can do in the classroom rather than pulling the kids into the nurse's office, et cetera? Those are some of the various things I've heard. Though again, I think that's been on a school by school basis, how they've set that up. Thank you. Um, flu season is coming. And is, is that gonna make my child more susceptible to COVID? Can I say if they take, uh, this is Duha, uh, if they take the flu vaccine, they will be less susceptible to getting flu. But I don't think there's any relationship from um, like between COVID and influenza, um, or at least that we know of. I think, I mean, I think we all know that anytime you have one virus or illness, you're you're worn down and more likely potentially to get another illness, but we don't know if there's any specific or have we, we have not identified any specific relationship between flu and COVID at this point. Um, of course, we are still very early in this response, so there may be more to learn. Yeah, I would add to that too. I mean, we see co-infection with viruses every, every season. Um, and to echo that last point, I think even more important that we stress the importance of getting vaccinated against influenza to try and prevent greater spread of infection and overwhelming hospital systems and trying to care for uh, the really sick patients that need elevated levels of care. I'll just also add another plug for, it, for an influenza vaccine um, to get your, to, for kids and adults to get their flu shots as well. Um, as we learn more and more about this, you know, uh, uh, more about this virus, I think it's important to, you know, take the necessary precautions that we know can help prevent against, you know, infection as we begin to learn more about it, you know, as we enter flu season in the winter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, oh, I'm sorry, I was going to say, I think that's important with the return to school too. I mean, if we can help eliminate symptoms that that echo, you know, viral symptoms are often similar. They, you know, they cough and cold and fever are common with both coronavirus and influenza. And if we can lessen, uh, lessen spread of illness in general, we maybe will disrupt, stop the disruption of the education of our students by having to constantly send more kids home from spreading illness. 
Exactly. And not only our students, but our teachers. Every time our teacher gets a flu-like illness, that could result in them being on home isolation as well, which could cause dis disruption in our classrooms and less stability for our kids. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of reasons to get the flu vaccine um, this year, I think, in particular. Even though we do anticipate that we may have a quieter flu season than usual, because all these things that we're putting into place to manage COVID also help control the spread of flu. So we anticipate there will be less flu, uh, but I know as a parent, the fewer chances I have of my kids suddenly being sprung on me sick and all of us having to quarantine and isolate, the better. Agreed. <laughs> Great. Yes. Thank you. Our next question is, now that schools are back, are we seeing an uptick in cases or spread in a specific age range? Ages that may be less susceptible? So based on my particular medical practice, I would not be seeing one just because of the patient population that I see. We wouldn't be seeing necessarily children with COVID anyway. Uh, so I'll defer to my other two colleagues because just on my, my subspecialty population, we wouldn't necessarily be seeing that regardless. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm on the pandemic task force um, school group. So we do look at that data on a fairly regular basis. What we see is that, because we break it up pretty much by five year age, age gaps when we're looking at the data, the zero to four, five to, to nine age group um, has always been and remains rather low. It has ticked up some, but nowhere near the same level that our adult population is. If you look at our, our 10 to 14, they're pretty close to our five to 10, um, just a little bit higher. And again, have been fairly stable with some rise as schools have gone back in. Um, for a while, we saw a fairly decent increase in our five to 19 year olds. That dropped off um, several weeks ago, at least in the St. Louis County area and has maintained uh, steady. In fact, I think they went down, um, they were the only group that meaningfully went down in the last two week period of data that the county released. So they're still low, but definitely there has been some increase in pediatric cases and how much of that is due to overall increase and how much of that is due to the fact that kids are getting, I think, tested more and presenting more since they are returning to school and clearly are going to spread it some more amongst themselves. Um, that remains to be teased out. Thank you. Please remember to submit your questions in the chat box. Um, our next question is, as a parent, I'm concerned about my child's mental health with the social distancing and quarantining, um, as well as the decrease in activities. How can I, as a parent, help my child? I'll start with that one. Um, so sort of similar to what I was saying before, I mean, you know, uh, one is sort of an acknowledgement of how, you know, different this this world has sort of changed rapidly, you know, especially for, you know, children. And I think, you know, when we talk about children's mental health, one of the things is what we, children are at different developmental levels are gonna respond um, to this sort of major life change for the time being in maybe different ways. So, you know, you're gonna see, for example, you know, um, younger children, uh, preschool, young school age children, you might see um, an increase in maybe some more disruptive behaviors, okay? Um, and um, in more school age, older children, um, you know, you might see more signs, especially like in adolescence, more signs of kind of deep, of, of, you know, a, a low mood, um, um, low, you know, act activity level. Um, so these are this, these are some of the things you may see as children, depending on where your child is sort of on, uh, in, in their development. Uh, so those are one, some of the things to, 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 to watch out for. Um, one of the things I think preventative ways we can try to, you know, proactively try to help children's mental health through this pandemic, you know, is, you know, kind of explaining things on a development appropriate level in a very matter of fact, you know, sort of way. Um, why do we have to wear masks, you know? Um, and why is it important to wear masks? If for children who aren't returning to school, you know, this fall, um, you know, that's obviously, especially for children who are obviously looking forward to returning to school, that's a big change for them. You know, explaining that to them, what, you know, understanding that some, some feelings of disappointment are likely to be had and are understandable. Um, and I also think it's actually pretty important to, you know, um, if you're noticing, you know, say, for example, of your older kids, you know, some 
prolonged periods of depressed mood or, or not liking, not wanting to do the types of things that they usually do to bring those concerns up to your child's pediatrician. Um, so we can, they can address that as, you know, as soon as possible. Um, the other thing is I kind of just uh, reiterate kind of before for people who might have been on here for our, our beginning was things such as like regular, a regular schedule, regular exercise, regular sleep, you know, healthy eating, um, limiting media consumption uh, are all kind of more proactive things we can do about, you know, to promote our kids' mental health during this kind of very different time. I think you mentioned earlier too, just the use of um, platforms like Zoom. You know, oh, yes. it's 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 a way to get some of those connections back with the children that need connection, so those social connections. So maybe setting up smaller group settings for your children with some of their close friends, lunch date, mm -hmm. um, distance mm -hmm. play dates. You know, those sorts of things I think uh, can be helpful as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Our next question. Do you know of any resources available for children with autism during COVID? Does Knights of Columbus evaluate teenagers with autism so they can qualify for services? So I guess I will take that one as well. Um, so the answer is yes. Yes, we do. We evaluate children um, of, you know, of, of any age, essentially. And uh, it's not necessary. you know, child comes in, you know, oftentimes the question is, does my child have autism? Um, but what we do is, you know, we don't just look at say, does your child have autism? Yes or no. It's, you know, what is, what is, what, what kind of get a holistic view of like what is going on, you know, with your child, their development, behavioral concerns, and then sort of, you know, make recommendations and diagnoses based on that. And lots of times, yes, the answer is autism, but other times it's not. And regardless of what the diagnosis is, we then provide the appropriate sort of rec the recommendations, point you in the right direction for resources. Um, I think, you know, as far as, you know, children, as far as programs at the Knights of Columbus, um, especially for kind of the teenage crowd, 12 to 18 years old, um, who are maybe struggling with, you know, um, uh, socialization, whether they actually are diagnosed officially with autism or not, we are fortunate enough to have a really great program called PEERS, or P-E-E-R-S. Um, it's sort of a social skills program. And, um, you know, prior to the pandemic, children would come to the actual Knights of Columbus building and all sit in a, you know, conference room and they would work on this sort of evidence-based social skills program. Uh, obviously, that's not happening right now, but they are doing those, those programs through Zoom. I mean, they've done a couple of sessions. We have some amazing people who are working on it. Um, and, um, you know, that's one, that's one program that we have, especially for children 12 to 18 years old, who are struggling a little bit with social skills, whether they have autism or not, that's a program that we have that can be accessed, you know, in a socially distanced way via Zoom. I think we have, Thank you. I think we have, I don't know if Karen Heiser is still on this, um, my, have some information about like further information sort of about that um, but that's one program we do have mm -hmm. great and we can make sure that we put that in the chat karen sure. has already put it in the chat box so oh, there, there we is. go thank you, karen. <laughs> thank you karen and we'll make sure that that gets out to when we send this out via social media um our next question is what should exposure or quarantine look like in the classroom or school setting can you go into detail on that um, so I can probably take that one since I've been in a lot of contact with um, the nurses and the public health departments. I will say that it is not as straightforward a decision-making process as I think all of us would like it to be. Um, it's not that you can follow an exact algorithm and figure out which students should be quarantined, isolated, which ones shouldn't. Um, so what happens is when there's a positive case of a student or a teacher who's been within the school, uh, a lot of times the school nurse or someone else at the school will initiate some contact tracing and start finding out who does, who's in the, other, the classrooms with this uh, student, um, where has the student been, what has the masking been looking like among the kids, how close are they sitting, and drawing up a basic li list. And then what public health, uh, Department of Public Health does is they go through that in a lot of detail to figure out, um, because it depends, were they wearing masks, but how well were they wearing their masks in this instance? What was the duration of time that the children were near each other, um, especially if it was less than six feet? Uh, was this an all day exposure or a 20 minute exposure? Um, 
were there encounters outside of schools? We know kids don't just see each other in school. They see each other on buses. They may see each other in carpooling, sports, activities, and it's often hard to figure out where exactly that exposure occurred. Um, so they'll take all that into account and then determine who needs to be uh, quarantined at that point in time uh, and make sure that there's no symptoms in those other students and arrange for any necessary testing. Uh, bear in mind again that once you are on quarantine, a negative COVID test does not eliminate the need to quarantine for the full 14 days. That's really important to know, especially since the CDC um, has come out more strongly recommending testing. That's important so we know what the prevalence and what whether or not there is more contact tracing needing to be done on that uh, close contact student, not because it changes your, um, your need to quarantine if it's negative. Thank you. Our next question, what is your sense of timing for a safe and effective vaccine? Is, it, is that required before school can return closer to the normal education experience for our kids? Um, so I guess I can pop in on that one as well. Um, I'm involved in some of our regional COVID vaccine planning efforts. Um, so uh, as you know, none of our vaccines, and there's around 20 or so I think that are currently in or near phase three trials uh, worldwide, none of them have finished their phase three trial and gotten approval by the FDA. Um, there is some indication that that may occur over the next three to six months. Um, there has been a lot of commitment to make sure that that approval is not given lightly. Um, and I personally think that's extremely important. Uh, I don't want anyone to ever have their trust in our vaccines undermined. Um, however, it, I think it's going to be quite some time, you know, there's going to be multiple iterations once we even have a vaccine that's to market and available till there's a sufficient supply. So there's going to be a prioritization tier of how we uh, designate vaccine in the community. Uh, as you, some of you may have heard, Pfizer is the first company to announce that they're going to begin trials in the pediatric age group. Um, and of course, those trials not only have to be started, they have to be completed as well. I do not anticipate the children will be near the top priority list as far as when we start vaccinating them for both the reasons of needing to get the trials on children, as well as um, who's the most impacted and hospitalized among our community. Uh, having said that, clearly, I don't think we're in a place where we can wait until we have a large number of our pediatric population immunized before children start returning to as normal an experience as possible. And I think what we're showing uh, with the schools that have opened so far is that with the precautions in place, they have been able to open uh, safely. And I think they'll continue to do so. And I think we'll continue to watch. One of the important factors for me as we go through our committees and we discuss these things is also taking the opportunity to measure what all these precautions are that are in place and determining which ones are the ones that are actually being the most effective. Because for me as a doctor, as a disaster manager, as a citizen, as a mom, if something's not working and it's restricting my kids' usual normal lifestyle, let's, let's stop doing it. And so I'm hopeful that we'll get a clearer picture of what the best modalities of protecting our kids and our, our teachers and everyone else who works at our schools uh, are and um, allow things to become more and more normal over time as we do wait for vaccine and um, uh, what herd immunity we're able to, to get uh, take place. Thank you. Um, our next question is, are children required to be tested for a single symptom, example, runny nose, or what, rem and then I guess it's a two-part question, what remote learning is provided during the turnaround time to determine if quarantine proves necessary? So most of the hospitals have, or sorry, most hospitals, most of the schools uh, in the county, the city, county area have been following the um, algorithm released by WUPARC, um, which is available online. Um, and it does, the agreement was to look for the most part at high risk versus low risk symptoms. So a single symptom in a high risk category is recommended to exclude and evaluate for testing. Um, and that would be cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, or a new taste of uh, new loss of taste or smell. Um, other lower risk symptoms they recommend if you have two or more um, for the testing and exclusion. And then I think the second part of that I think is probably 
dependent on the school in which they they attend and what their plan what their process is so i think that's a difficult one to answer but definitely checking with your school i think it's important parents are informed about what that process is when your child if they do get quarantined or get sent home from for being sick and they get tested and obviously they need to stay home while any tests are pending what is the process from the school i think that's important that parents are educated on those those plans thank you um, Karen also put in some information. So we have our information for the peers program, but also um, for parents of special needs um, children, there are some support lines available such as the one below. So there are um, available um, options for our parents out there. Um, our next question is, where do I take my child for COVID-19 testing? Is it safe to go to the doctor right now? take that one yeah i mean i think it's probably more safe than other than ever to take your child to the doctor right now knowing all the precautions that that offices um are taking so um i mean i can at least speak for our offices at Glennon, as far as health screenings on all of our providers and staff members we're universally masking all staff um, and anybody that comes into the clinic we're limiting visitors that are coming in with our patients so that we can maintain social distancing, trying to limit use of waiting rooms so that we can room them immediately and get them behind closed doors. So, um, you know, there's lots of things going on in the clinics to try and protect our patients and our staff uh, from becoming sick. Um, and now I just forgot the second part of the question because I was so focused on the safety of, <laughs> of the offices. But testing was the second part. So as far as where you can go from testing, there's options, I think, starting with your primary care doctor. Call your pediatrician and see what they would recommend. Some offices do have tests available. Um, so some, sometimes we're able to accomplish those tests in the office. Uh, more and more of those supplies are becoming available. Uh, and if, if your pediatrician isn't able to offer the testing, um, they should be able to direct you to local urgent cares, um, health departments, other centers that, that have testing supplies available. Thank you. Um, another question is, is what are hospitals doing to keep um, parents as well as the kids safe during their visit? So I can speak about, answer about the, what we do from the outpatient setting, sort of in the clinic. Uh, it's very similar to what Dr. Phillips was saying. Um, so, you know, what, for our patients who are coming to the Knights of Columbus Developmental Center, um, we have a, a screening for kids, parents, and temperature checks before they come into the building, screening for uh, some of those like higher symptoms that uh, I believe Dr. Charney was talking about for you know COVID-19 as well as a temperature check. Um, we have universal masking of um, all of our um, um, staff members and parents. Um, we um, actually try to, we very much limit the amount of people who are in the waiting room. In fact, our waiting room is pretty much empty um and uh, uh families pretty much come from their car and meet they get they get a symptom screen a temperature check they go straight to the waiting room that I mean the the um the exam room where they meet with the therapist or physician who's also wearing a mask and we also wear protective eye goggles as well there's hand sanitizer everywhere um and um afterwards actually we um to prevent people from uh kind of congregating in the waiting room as you kind of as you know, wait in line to schedule your, uh, your next appointment. Uh, our front desk staff, which has been excellent, will just reach out to you usually the next day to schedule his, a follow-up appointment if needed to really try to just decrease sort of the congregation uh, in that waiting room. Um, so that's sort of the out, so that's kind of a view of maybe an outpatient setting that's associated with a hospital. I don't know if anyone sees more of an inpatient setting. I'll let them take that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I can speak more to the hospital experience. Um, so at our hospitals, what we're doing is screening uh, for all of our visitors as they come in. We have some limitations to the number and type of visitors, depending on where you're going within the hospital. Uh, and then we have um, limitations and rules regarding any of our public shared spaces and how those spaces are being utilized to make sure that we keep it socially distanced, that we have things adequately clean. Um, and those are the measures that we've been putting into place. I would add too, I mean, I think um, various offices have their own policies and procedures. So again, I, I, 
I uh, encourage parents to call their physicians and find out what what they are doing to maintain um, the safety of patients that are coming in. Um, and I know here with our Glennon offices, the other option is telehealth. So if it's if we have a high risk patient or there's high risk family members and they're just still not comfortable coming into the office, even with all the safety measures we have in place, uh, we do have the option of providing care via video visits as well. Thank you all. Um, so that is all the questions that we have so far. Oh, there's one more that just came in. So. How does effective mask use in a child mitigate against the decision to not be quarantined if exposure to a known infected teacher or peer occurs? Can immediate single tests rather than two tests have ability to preclude isolation or quarantine? Um, so I can take that, that one. Um, so we know that masking helps and we know it's not perfect. We all know that how you wear it um, does impact things. But when you're effectively masked, even, um, even if you do, we know there's less viral load. And it seems to be that people who get infected when they have been doing effective mask use have more mild disease in general, which is really uh, good to, to see. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to the impact of effective mask use in children about the decision to be quarantined, it is very dependent on... Um, public health departments and taking them, I think a lot of them take it into account, but the CDC does not officially say that cloth masks can exclude um, quarantine or ice, uh, quarantine needs. Um, so it's, it's very case by case basis, but it's taken into account by our public health departments when they're making those determinations. Um, as far as testing, again, if you've been, if you need to go into quarantine and you've been exposed, a negative test does not change the need to do that, neither one nor multiple tests. Um, at any point, negative during that quarantine, eliminate that need for quarantine. And, and just for terminology purposes, isolation is um, when you've had a positive test or you're a, a person who's under investigation, you're waiting for a test, you're symptomatic and waiting for a test. Quarantine is when you are um, not symptomatic, but you've been exposed to someone with COVID and you're being quarantined to be sure you do not develop COVID in that time period. Thank you for that explanation. Welcome. Um, Dr. Phillips mentioned telehealth visits. Can you speak more to the type of visits or care that can be done via the video visits? Sure, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of possibilities. Um, the, the biggest one that, that we've been able to utilize, I'd say the most of our patients are kids that have chronic conditions that they may be taking medication for, so asthma, ADHD. Um, so being able, to, being able to follow up those families without bringing them into the office to find out how their symptoms are, are currently being managed on medications and providing refills. Um, it, the it, it does depend upon obviously the quality of video too but there there are other things like pink eye that if we we're able to get a good look at the eye certain rashes poison ivy was a big one over the summer um things that we can adequately see on the video we can perform those visits as well um acute visits you know if the children are sick and they're going to need tests for things like strep throat potential need for antibiotics those are the types of visits that you know we need to see them in the office for but there's a lot of possibilities for uh, the telehealth platform. I'd just also like to add, so we also do some, some selected telemedicine visits as well. I think the types of um, um, you know, visits that are, for, in our experience, have been you know, more amenable to telehealth or uh, a lot of developmental follow-ups of kids with either autism spectrum disorder, developmental delays, um, and being able to, especially again, as Dr. Phil said, it's video quality is pretty good. And uh, to be able to see the kids, you know, interact um, without necessarily having to bring them into the building. Um, there are some times, depending on the type of medic, if our children are on certain types of medications, we feel like we need to bring them in the building. Um, if we're going to get, you know, uh, as Dr. Phyllis mentioned, like certain lab works or things like that. Uh, but we try to do, especially for like follow-up visits, as you know, as much telehealth as we reasonably could. I would also, you know, add that there's always the option if, if something changes, escalates, we start a video visit and find that it's just, we're not able to accomplish what we need, then, you know, then to tell the parent, you know, I think it's a great idea to 
to come into the office, we can actually lay our hands on the patient or see what we need to see. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions at this time. Um, so if there are no more questions, um, I will um, ask as we wrap up that uh, maybe each of the panelists for some final thoughts for tonight's um, event. Do we have a question? No? Oh. <laughs> oh, there is one more question now. More. Okay. Yeah. Yes, came through. So do you recommend children with the with at risk household family members to be in remote learning? I think that's a difficult one to answer and it's, it's very individual to the family, depending upon how high risk the, the, the family member is and also looking at the needs of the individual child too. So how well are they able to accomplish virtual learning? Do they have developmental difficulties or issues that they'd be better served getting therapies in person? I think there's a lot of variables that will come into play, but would encourage families to have those conversations with their pediatrician. Um, we have a lot of those conversations to look at risk benefits for individual family members. I also kind of add on that and kind of make this my sort of like last thought. Um, because like this decision to sort of the decision for remote learning versus in-person learning, have that discussion with some families as well, especially for if certain family members are at risk or if that child themselves are considered high risk. Um, I just think my final thoughts, like, these can be very difficult decisions. I do agree with, you know, talking to your child's pediatrician, talking to if it's, you know, if it's an at-risk family, you know, member, talking to their physician, getting as much information as you, as you can. As it relates to, you know, the kids, for those, you know, for those families who decide to go, you know, in-person versus remote, you know, both decisions, you know, you know, are not like how school was last year, even if you go in-person versus, you know, remote. I think supporting children in both ways, you know, uh, whether they are remote or in-person, you know, is really important, you know, regardless of what the final decision a family makes. Each family is going to have to, especially families who are dealing with either at-risk children or at-risk family members, you know, are going to have to, you know, make a decision, you know, uh, that's best for them. We're dealing with a lot of different variables. Uh, so no one answer uh, from any of us is going to be able to answer that for all families. Um, but without, whatever the final, you know, decision a family makes, you know, um, for my from that for the, for, the, uh, for the families that I've had this discussion with, I've had some that goes in person, some that goes remote uh, for various reasons. I support both of them, you know, uh, for each individual family. And it's really taught, the next step is how do we support our remote kids and how do we support our in-person kids who, at least for the time being, are going back to school. It looks a lot different than it was, you know, a year ago. Um, and so that was, those are my final thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, final thoughts for me. I mean, I think that we're continuing to learn, you know, we're learning a lot more every day about all of this. So I think it's important that we adapt and change as we continue to learn. Um, and I think it's important that there's communi constant communication with healthcare providers and the schools and administrators um, and public health officials um, to continue to have that open line of communication. And I think the other thing as far as kids are concerned, I think it's important that we continue to model the behavior for them so that they understand the importance. We continue to follow guidelines and try and keep, uh, keep us all as safe as possible as we try and get back to a more normal uh, way of life. Yeah, I would kind of reflect what everybody else has said. Um, going back to school and the health of our kids in our schools is is tricky. I, I struggled for a while this summer trying to decide which way we were going to go with our kids. And it was partially family members. It was partially the needs of of my children. For one, one point, I was considering making different decisions for different of my kids based on what they needed from school and what I thought that would look like for them. Um, I was concerned about how my kids would handle it and whether it would be almost more traumatic to be at school than to be at home. And um, would they wear their mask appropriately, et cetera. And, um, I must say I've been, kids are surprisingly resilient a lot of the times. And I've been really impressed by how 
all the kids, not just mine, all the kids I've seen, how well kids are managing through this. And I just, you know that behind those resilient kids are some resilient parents. Um, this has been really, really hard. I think we need to continue to show grace to each other. Um, no one's going to look at this the same way. Um, there are some risks that are higher on concern for some people than they are for others and some benefits that are higher for some people than others. We all live such very different lives. And I think the best thing we can do is to make the best choices for our own family and to protect each other as best as we can through do this. Um, there is nothing I want more than to be able to send my kid back to school full day next year without a mask on and let them play on the playground and hug their friends. Um, and I hope that's where we wind up. Um, I'm just proud of all the tremendous amount of work that I have seen everyone in our community put forth to get our St. Louis area back to where it is at this point um, and just all the hard work. So thank you from everyone. Well, thank you, Dr. Kerr. Cormier, Dr. Charney, and Dr. Phillips. And thank you all for attending this evening. Um, again, um, this event is being recorded and we will share um, this via our social media outlets and on our website. Um, but please remember to visit our website at www.cardinalglennon.com for further information on how to access care at Cardinal Glennon. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.